Hello again, this is Dr. Bomb Stark, and today we're going to talk about polymorphism. So, uh, last class we looked at UML uh, and inheritance, um, overriding methods uh, using inheritance and, um, and interfaces, and uh, the concept of protected access to variables and, and methods. Um, today we're going to keep keep going in that same vein and look at you know what a lot of these things are good for and, and what these things imply about how we can write our code. Um, in particular, we're looking at, at polymorphism, and we're also going to finish up with a, a brief discussion of the idea of overwriting a method versus overloading the method. So, polymorphism is related to inheritance, and uh, we want to start with some general guidelines, ground rules for, for, for dealing with inheritance. Uh, we only want to use inheritance, We only meaning we only want to take a class and, and write a subclass of it when there is um, a close relation between the two um, in, in terms of some shared behavior they may have. You know, the two classes are going to have different behavior in the end, but one, one is going to have some subset of the other's behavior. Um, the, the best rule of thumb for doing this, um, for making sure you're using inheritance properly, is the is a relationship. The child class is a kind of the parent class. If you can't say that in your head or say it out loud and have it make sense, then you probably don't have an inheritance relationship uh, and you need to investigate something else. So, use one of the examples we'll see later in, in this lecture. A circle is a shape. A rectangle is a shape. Now, a circle is not a rectangle. So, we wouldn't want to have a circle extend from rectangle. But, a square is a rectangle, as well as a rectangle is a shape. So, when you can say it like that, it makes sense. That's really where inheritance um, comes into play. Another time people tend to abuse an inheritance is when two class, two objects really only differ in the values of their instance variables, meaning differ, differ in their state. When that happens, really those are two objects of the same class. We shouldn't have two separate classes to describe each of those things. Um, and the very last thing, we need to avoid the use of protected. Um, for me personally, you almost never need a protected var uh, instance variable. Um, protected really only applies to methods and, and constructors and usually only in situations where we're developing frameworks where we extend a framework by subclassing something. Um, so it, it's not that we need to avoid protected, we need to use it very, very sparingly. It's usually only when there needs to be some explicit communication from the parent class to the child class. So here's the question. Before you learned about inheritance, can you store circle objects and rectangle objects in an array list? The answer was no. Um, you would have to have one array list for your circle objects and another array list for your rectangle objects um, because you know an array list can only hold one kind of object at a time. But with inheritance, we can come up with a way to m store them in an array list as shapes. So let's take a look at some, um, some code here. We have an array list of shape. We've, we've initialized it to an empty list. Um, we've created a new shape object here with a red color, and I guess the true is whether it's filled or not, and we've added that to our array list. We've also created a rectangle, and we were able to add it to our array list of shapes. This works. It works because a rectangle is a shape. Rectangle inherits from shape, and so we can put a rectangle anywhere a shape is expected. We can do the same thing with a circle. And notice in this case, we've, we've created our, our circle object but we've assigned it to a shape variable. This also works. Again, because a circle is a type of shape, we can put a circle 
anywhere a shape is expected. And again, of course, we can add that to our, um, our list of shapes. And even more, so we've got, we've got a for loop here that iterates over all the shapes in our list of shapes. We can call methods on each one of them as if they were a shape. We call this polymorphism. It's when an object reference whose type is a superclass can reference an instance of the subclass. And down at the bottom is just a restatement of what I said before. An array list of shapes can hold any kind of shape as long as they extend that shape uh, parent class. Again, the rule of thumb, you know, it, it, a circle can be used anywhere a shape is expected. A rectangle can be used anywhere a shape is expected. In general, the subclass can be used anywhere the superclass is expected. Polymorphism means many shapes. The, the ability of an object to take on many forms. So now we can have a variable that may take on the form of more than one class. So if a variable is of a type X, for example, it can refer explicitly to an object of type X or to any object that is a subclass of X. Again, the subclass can go anywhere the parent is expected. In Java, a variable with a superclass type can reference the superclass as well as any of its subtypes. And this goes back to what we said before. Here we have a shape variable, we can put a circle in it because a circle is a shape. Here we have a shape variable, shape B, we can put a rectangle in it because a rectangle is also a shape. We can even put a square in it because a square is a rectangle and a rectangle is a shape. Therefore, a square is also a shape. Here we have a rectangle going to a rectangle, which we know we can do that. That's, that, that, that happens uh, we know that from CS1. Um, here we have a rectangle variable and we're placing a square into it because a square is a rectangle. So we can do all of these kinds of things uh, with uh, by using inheritance and polymorphism. In my, when I'm, I teach CS1, I, I tell my, my CS1 students to always make sure when they have an equal sign that the type on either side is the same. You know. So you have a rectangle declared on one side, you must have a rectangle object instantiated on the other side or something like that. Uh, polymorphism is actually the exception to that rule. So we, it's almost like I told you, I didn't tell you the entire story before. Now we can have different um, types on either side of that assignment as long as the type on the right is a subclass of the type on the left. All right, let's take a look at this UML diagram again for a minute. Uh, here's our shape, which has a color and uh, a Boolean to tell whether or not it's filled. Uh, it's got a default, a no parameter constructor. Uh, and it has all sorts of constructor to set the color and, and whether it's filled or not. Uh, getter and setter for the color, has uh, getter for whether it's filled, has a setter for filled, and has a two string. Uh, circle extends that by adding a, a radius instance variable. It has its own uh, constructors. Um, remember, we don't inherit constructors from the parent. Um, getters and setters for the radius has a compute area to compute a circles area, and it has its own version of two string. This is what we're going to see later when we talk about overriding. Uh, rectangle does some sim something similar. It has a width and a height because that's the major dimensions we deal with with rectangle. Uh, it has its own constructors, some getters and setters for the height and width. It can also compute an area. It can also do a two string. So what methods can be called um, when we're talking about polymorphism? I have two variables here. One is a shape, one is a circle. Circle green is our shape, circle blue is our circle. We're assigning a color, a uh, circle object to both of them. Again, this works for shape because circle is a shape. And of course, the second one, circle on the left, circle on the right, we know that works. 
In these two lines, I'm calling set filled on each one of them. This works. Because if we go back a, um, a, a slide, we have a set filled that belongs to shape. So we know that, that, that that's available to bo both our objects because both of them are shapes. However, right here we, have, we ha may have a problem. So we have circle green is calling compute area and circle blue is calling compute area. Well, let's look at where those actually are. Compute area only exists in circle and rectangle. Now, the actual objects um, pointed to by circle green and circle blue are, in fact, circle objects. But it won't work here because the circle green variable is of type shape. We can't call compute area on it even though the underlying object has a compute area method, because we're going through um, something of type shape, we can't access that. So you would actually get a, um, a, a compile area, error here. Similarly, um, for circle green dot get radius, um, the same thing would happen. Circle green is, is a shape. It does not have there is no get radius method available to shapes, only to circles. And again, even though circle green is a circle object underneath the hood, we're still referring to it as a shape. And therefore, we can't do get radius on it. So as it says, we're going to have, uh, have an error flag by the compiler there. That one's OK. That one's also going to be flagged by the compiler. That one's OK. So we, when we uh, treat objects polymorphically, only the type of the variable or parameter or whatever that we're using to refer to that variable, that determines the methods that we have available to it, not the underlying object. So this is where we get into the concept of a declared versus an actual type. So in this case, our, de our declared type is shape even though our actual type is a circle under the hood. It's that declared type that tells us what methods we can use. So let's look at this code. Uh, we have an array list of shapes. We took a rectangle like, and we added that to our shapes. We created a circle but called it uh, a shape through its variable and added that to our, our list of shapes. Um, we even added some other kind of shape here, a hexagon to it as well. We have a list where we're printing out the area of each shape using curveshape.compute area. Um, which compute area method is invoked? Won't even compile because a shape does not have a compute area area. So the next question is, what if we changed it to current shape dot to string? This is where the notion of dynamic binding comes in. Java invokes the method of the actual type. The actual type may not be known when we're writing the code, meaning um, compile time, but Java will figure it out for us as it's running. So for example, if our shape class happened to not implement toString, it would look in, the, in the, uh, the child class, the actual object, to see if it had one. And would call that as in, in, instead. Um, so here, we have shape as our variable and a rectangle as our actual. So shape is the, um, the declared type, rectangle is the actual type. We're calling toString on that. So whose toString gets called? Is it shapes or is it rectangles? And the answer is rectangles. We go as far down the, the inheritance hierarchy as we can until um, we find one.
Um, so we'll, we'll try to do the actuals if possible. If the actual doesn't have a version of that method, we'll move up to the, uh, to the parent. In this next illustration, we have um, shape as the declared type and circle as the actual type. And we're calling toString on that. And in that, and in that case, it will call toString on the child class, the child type, which is circle. Last example, shape is the declared type, shape is the actual type as well. So when we call toString then, it will be called on shape. So let's look at another example. This is calculator. Um, think about this top one as a very basic calculator that does addition and subtraction, multiply and divide. So, uh, and has, has methods and, and, and state for doing that. We're extending it by creating a scientific calculator um, that has some things useful for doing scientific calculations. Um, you know, trigonometric uh, functions, uh, an exponent function, a power, inverse, oops, uh, all things would be useful to us. Scientific calculator, because it inherits from calculator, will also be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So let's kind of look at what this, um, how this will be done in code. A public class calculator, uh, we have some sort of result that we're, we're, we're storing a, as an instance variable. Uh, we have a constructor, which initializes that to zero, getter, setter, and then some code to do addition, subtraction, multiply, and divide, all public methods. Our scientific calculator is going to extend that. Um, and it's, um, going to uh, define some sine, cosine, tangent, inverse methods, and so forth. Here's where things, we, we start have to thinking through what's going on. In our sine method, we're making a call to this dot get result. Now normally, when we call this, it says look in the current class. Well, our scientific calculator class does not have a get result method. If it did, this dot get result would refer to it. However, our parent class does have a get result. And in this particular case, this dot get result, since it can't find it in the child class, it will look in the parent class. It's equivalent to our second example here where we're saying super dot get result. Both of them are going to call the parent, since there is no get result here. However, if there were a get result in scientific calculator, this would refer to the local one in scientific calculator. Super would refer to the one in uh, the parent calculator class. And I think this slide is just kind of restating the things I said before. So if we don't have a method that's overridden, this or super can refer to method, methods in the parent class. But if, um, if we have overridden a method uh, in the child class, this will refer to the child class version. So it's a good idea, um, you know, at least at this stage of, 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 your, of your learning, um, to be kind of explicit. If you intend to call the, 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 uh, a method in the parent, even if it's not overridden, put super in front of it. And if you intend to call a method in the child, put this in front of it. And that, that way, we as the readers know exactly where it's going to go. Um, and that'll help you avoid situations like at the bottom. Um, we're overriding a method, meaning there is a version of it in the parent. Uh, in this case, it's a two string. We're calling this dot to string, meaning we call this version. We're calling ourself, so we have an infinite loop, and um, eventually we'll run out of stack space and get that stack overflow error that we all love to hate. All right, um, word on multiple subclasses. Um, any class with some exceptions that we won't talk about, uh, can be extended as many times as, as needed. So if we look over to the, to the right, we have some 
an example of this. We have a calculator, and we've extended it as a scientific calculator, and we've extended it as a financial calculator. So we could do that. We could have more types uh, extend from it if need be. The restriction is that any one class can only inherit from one other. It's what we call single inheritance. So a scientific calculator could not inherit from a calculator and a computer. Okay, we have to pick one. We can only we can only extend or inherit from one class. Um, that said, a subclass in this case, like a financial calculator, can also be subclassed as well. So the rule is simply that any class can only have one immediate parent. Some some languages will will have multiple inheritance. Java opted not to do so, and um, I think it was the right idea. Multiple inheritance gets really ugly sometimes. All right, so we have a, a piece of code here. Tell me if you see a problem. Calculator is um, the declare type here. Scientific calculator is the, um, the actual type there. So far, so good. So we're calling calc.setResult4.0. So we think about our polymorphism rules. The declared type of calc is calculator, so we need to see if it has a set result method. And it does, so we're okay. We're going to do calc.add. So we, again, calc's declared type is calculator, so let's see if it has an add method. And it does, so it should be good so far. Next line, uh, we have a, a variable num of type double. We're assigning to it calc.getResult. Again, calc is of type calculator. Let's see if it has a getResult method. It does, so we're good. <clears throat> Last line, we have a value of type double. We're calling calc.sign. The declared type of calc, of calc is calculator. Does it have a sign method? Add, subtract, multiply, divide, get result, set result. No sign there. We're obviously trying to use the sign from scientific calculator. And even though this is a scientific calculator object, we're still limited to the uh, methods given by the declared type. So this would give us a compiler error. Now, what we could do, and Make no mistake, here be dragons, tread cautiously. We could do a cast to our calc and call sign on the casted object. This will work. Be absolutely sure oops, that you know there's a, there's a scientific calculator under there. And in general, you're, you're not going to be absolutely sure um, unless... Uh, within some limitations. So do this sparingly. Um, the follow, uh, and, and the reason why is given in this, um, this example below. Uh, we have uh, declared type of, ca of calculator, uh, actual type of scientific calculator. This next line will not be caught as a compile error. We're casting calc to financial calculator. It's a valid cast at compile time because we don't know the underlying type of we, we, at compile time we don't know the underlying type of, of calc. So the, this will pass through the compiler, but when we try to call interest rate on a scientific calculator um, object, we're going to have a problem. In fact, I, I think we won't even make it that far because the cast itself will fail um, because the underlying type is not a financial calculator type. Um, we're going to get what's called a class cast exception. And this is a runtime ex uh, exception and unchecked. So be very, very careful. That's why we want to avoid um, casts to the greatest extent possible. Um, sometimes they're unavoidable. Um, other things related to this, like uh, how do we determine the type of a class? Um, so we have a line of code that, that returns a calculator object could be a calculator, could be a scientific calculator, business calculator, financial calculator, we don't know. Uh, we do know there's a lots of possibilities in that inheritance hierarchy. Um, 
every object in Java has a git class uh, method that it inherited from the object class. And that will return us an object um, that is the real class of that, that object. Um, and if we do git class dot git name, it will tell us the entire name of, of the object. So that's one way we can do this. Again, one of those things we, we want to be careful about using, but sometimes they're, um, they're just unavoidable. Um, again, related to this, the instance of operator. This is not a method. It's not a function or anything like that. It's, um, it's actually a Boolean uh, expression of sorts. So instance of is a keyword in Java, and it's to test whether an object is an instance of a speci uh, specific type. And the type can be a class or interface. Um, so here we have a declared type of calculator, um, and we don't know what the actual type is. Could be calculator, could be scientific calculator, could be business, who knows. Um, we can write an if statement that says if calc is an instance of scientific calculator, now we can safely cast it and call it sign method. Otherwise, we'll, you know, take some other action. Um, so that's a way we can safely do our casts um, if something is of a particular type. Uh, again, be cautious with this. It's usually, it's not that this is a, a, a dangerous way to do things. It's kind of safe in this case. It's just there's usually better ways around it, um, and, and you'll learn those as we go. Um, so this last, uh, this page, is, it's kind of some warnings there. Um, you know, if, if you learn uh, your polymorphism and dynamic binding really well, usually that means you can um, get rid of the instance operator, instance of operator in most cases. Okay, last little bit of the day, we'll talk about method overloading. Um, make sure I get this link. Okay, yeah. Um, method overloading, you have two or more methods um, in the same class that have the same name. They, the main way they differ is in the parameters. They have different types of parameters or different numbers of parameters, um, but some one way or another, you can distinguish them by their parameters. Um, the return type doesn't matter. Uh, I think it's typical that the return type is often the same, but it doesn't have to be. Um, um, they are really just like unique methods in, in, uh, inside the class. So some um, examples we've seen before, assert equals, uh, print in the, in, in the print stream, print line, those things are, are overloaded in several ways. Um, and here's some more, uh, here's some examples of how we could do this. Um, we could have an add method that takes two parameters. Additionally, we could have an add method that takes three. And it would be legal to have both of these in the same class. That's what we, we call overloading. Um, you could also have different parameter types. So here we have one that adds two integers and returns an int. Here we have one that adds two doubles and returns a double. Again, this is legal and, and perfectly acceptable, and it's actually uh, a good way to do things. It would, it would allow us to treat ints and doubles differently. Um, and you can even have um, parameters that, that differ in type. So here we have an add with two ints. Here we have an add with an int and a double. Um, the key points, they have the same method name. Oops. Uh, different parameters, either number or type, and uh, again, the return type doesn't matter. These are really just a convenience for um, being able to name the same operation uh, on different kinds of data. So um, earlier languages wouldn't allow us to do that. So uh, some things that won't work with overloading. Um, you can't have two methods with different return types but the same parameters. So this divide and that divide even though they return differently, the types of their parameters are the same. And to be clear, it's the types of the parameters that matter, not the names of the parameters. We could have a divide with int dividend, int divisor, and a divide with int x and int y, and we're still going to have a compile problem. 
it's the it's the position and and types of those parameters that that makes the difference and so we have to be careful with that um, and then, oh and that's what we're seeing with this this next um, little little bit we have a convert to seconds that takes int minutes we have a convert to seconds that takes int hours these are indistinguishable and we'll throw a compile error again it's just the types that make make the difference all right so overloading versus overriding which we've talked about some before overloading happens um, on methods within the same class whereas overriding um, is uh, between methods of the su superclass and the subclass or the parent and the child so with overriding we take a, a method that's in the parent and we rewrite it in the child with overloading method names are the same but they have different parameters with overriding they, they have the uh, exact same signature, same name, same types of parameters, same return type. With overloading, um, you know, they can actually determine at compile type which one is being, uh, in, being called uh, because we, we know from the difference in the parameters. With overriding, uh, we actually have to look at, at uh, runtime and decide which one is, is being called. All right, that is uh, polymorphism and dynamic binding, binding and overloading versus overriding. Um, next class, we're going to, again, continue in this vein where we look at abstract classes and methods, which make use of kind of all these concepts uh, in one way or another. As always, if you have questions, please let me or your, um, your other instructor know. Thanks, and have a good one.